Stand by for crime. Hi, Chuck Morgan again. You know, sometimes a newsman has a dry spell. A series of days in which you can't seem to latch onto anything of feature proportions. Well, I had one of those dry spells. Which is why when I arrived at my office the other morning and found my blonde secretary, Carol Curtis, waiting for me with an urgent message from a man in a hospital, I was ready to listen. What's it all about, Glamour Puss? Why does he want to see me? He didn't say. He told me his name was Tom Edwards. He's in the home of Mercy Hospital. He said if you'd come to see him, he'd give you a story that would make your audience's scalps creep. Ooh, sounds gruesome. Uh, let's go over there, Chuck. We can't lose anything. One more broadcast like your 11 o'clock show last night, you may not have an audience, period. No cracks, Glamour Puss. <laughs> All right, get on your bonnet and we'll see what's on gruesome Tom's mind. The home of Mercy Hospital is a huge pile of gray stones stacked up on a hill overlooking the great sprawling city of Los Angeles. Following directions, Glamour and I moved through a maze of corridors, anterooms, waiting rooms, and stairways, and finally wound up at room 1616. A nurse admitted us, and then she departed. Tom Edwards lay on a bed, swathed in bandages, with only his eyes and mouth visible. You're Chuck Morgan, KOP newscaster? Yes, that's right. This is my secretary, Miss Curtis. Hello. You seem to be in pretty bad shape, Mr. Edwards. Have an accident? No. No, it wasn't an accident. Mr. Morgan, if I tell you what happened to me, will you promise to use it on one of your broadcasts? Well, I don't know. I can't tell at this point how much news value your story might have. It has news value, plenty. If you use it, Mr. Morgan, you'll be doing a great many people a favor. Fools like myself. You mentioned over the phone that the story would make people who listen to it have creepy scalps. That sounds kind of gruesome. It's more than gruesome, Miss Curtis. It's horrible. Horrible. Well, I guess you'd better let us in on it, Mr. Edwards, so we can begin adding up the score. And I have your promise? No, I'm sorry, but I can't do that until I know the facts. Just why are you so anxious to have Chuck's promise that he'll use the story, Mr. Edwards? Because if he doesn't, then everything will be for nothing. Just what do you mean by that? Because within 24 hours after you broadcast the story... I'm going to be murdered. Well, this smelled like a story of future proportions, all right. But on the other hand, it put me on a spot. If what Tom Edwards said were true, if he actually were murdered upon the broadcast of his story... That would make me a party to the crime, wouldn't it? On the other hand, if I didn't hear the story, how could I know what chance there was of his being murdered? And if I didn't promise to use the story, I wouldn't hear it. Quite a merry-go-round. Then I had an idea. That's a pretty broad statement, Mr. Edwards. What makes you think you'll be murdered? Believe me, Mr. Morgan, it's true. Uh, I can't tell you how I know unless you promise. But if he promises and you're murdered, that'll be Chuck's fault. Well, he needn't worry about that. I want to die. No, wait, that's not the statement of a rational man, Mr. Edwards. Oh, yes, I'm rational, all right. Don't you worry about that. Then you must have a very good reason for wanting to die. I have. Two, in fact. First, I'll have accomplished my purpose of exposing this... this terrible thing that's happening. And second, my wife can have her operation. Your wife is ill, Mr. Edwards? It's horrible. Day and night, she suffers excruciating pain. There's no relief... She must have the operation. She simply must. And the insurance money your wife will collect if you're murdered will pay for the operation. Yes, that's right. Seems to me that there are agencies and clinics that would be glad to... Not in this case, Miss Curtis. Naomi will have to be sent back east. There are only one or two specialists in the country who can perform the operation. Oh, I've investigated everything. I'll tell you what, Mr. Edwards. I can't give you my word I'll use your story, but... I can promise you I won't use it unless I'm reasonably sure you won't be murdered. You can't be sure. I know those men. There's nothing, no form of fiendishness that they're not capable of. Well, then I'm afraid it's no dice. Oh, Chuck, there must be something I'm afraid not, Grandma Puss. Mr. Edwards, don't lose this chance. You know Chuck and what he's done about rackets before. Otherwise, you wouldn't have sent for him. Tell him your story. 
He'll find an answer to your problem. He always does. Now, wait a minute, Clement. Uh, put your faith in him, Mr. Edwards. If this racket is as bad as you say it is, you're not being fair if you can stop it and don't. Well, I'm... I don't know. Naomi... Oh, we'll take care of your wife. I can promise you that. She'll have her operation. Oh, yes, but the money... Don't go overboard, Glamour I'm not. If it's only money that's standing in the way, I'll get it myself. Where? Well, what difference does it make where? I'll get it. If Pappy Mansfield knew the circumstances, he'd put it up. Well, Mr. Edwards? If you can promise me that my wife... I can, and I already have. Now, tell us the story. Very well. I will. My wife's illness came on about a year ago. We had a few dollars saved, but her condition became increasingly worse, and it wasn't long before the reserve was gone. So I began to borrow from every source I knew. And then one day came the blow. We were told that she must have the operation. It was the next night when I came home to find Naomi worse than ever. Naomi? Is that you, Tom? Oh, oh Naomi, darling, I, I couldn't see you in the darkness. I'll turn on the light here. There we are. Oh, Naomi. Oh. It's worse, isn't it? Yes, Tom, it's worse. Please don't worry. I'm sure I'll be better soon. Yes, Naomi, you will be better. You're going to have your operation. Oh, but, Tom, the money... Uh, darling, listen to me. I had lunch today with a, a Mr. Bassett, oh. Mr. Ray Bassett. Mm. He sat at my table in the cafeteria, and we fell into conversation. He must have guessed that I was in trouble by my attitude. And before I knew it, uh, I told him the whole story. And what do you think? What, Tom? Um... He said he knew a way I could get the money. And if I'd come to his office tomorrow, he'd tell me about it. You knew a way of getting money? Oh, but, Tom, darling, there's no way of getting money without working for Well, it. that's just it, dear. He has something I can do to earn the money. Well, naturally, I expect to have to work. It's strange he didn't mention what it was while you were having lunch. How does he know that it's the type of work you can do? It's such a large sum that we need Oh, no, 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 darling, don't you worry about a thing. This Mr. Bassett's a nice chap. He was very sympathetic and understanding, and we should be grateful for his interest. Of course, we are grateful. Tom, you don't think he wants you to do something... Dishonest. Dishonest? Oh, well, of course not. Now you just stop fretting. Let me handle this, will you? Well, I have an appointment with Mr. Bassett tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Oh. And after that, you're going to have your operation and be well and happy again. Oh, Tom. I promise you. Oh, well, Mr. Edwards. Come in. <laughs> morning, Mr. Bassett. Yes, I'm a little bit early. No, not at all. I can understand your eagerness perfectly. I want you to meet Dr. Nard Alexander. Dr. Alexander, this is Tom Edwards, the man I was telling you about. Oh, how do you do? Oh, doctor. Well, then perhaps... Now, Dr. Alexander is not a specialist, Mr. Edwards. I'm sorry. He's a general practitioner. However, because of his knowledge of certain types of, um, now, diseases, I think he might prove valuable to you as if he were a specialist in the trouble which has afflicted your wife. Oh, well, that sounds encouraging. Yes. Now, then, as I mentioned yesterday, there are ways of obtaining life large sums of money with very little effort. But um, we must close our eyes to certain uh, principles. Oh? Well, I don't believe I understand. Mr. Edwards, there are many large insurance companies in this city that have unlimited funds ready to be paid out to people making claims against them. Yes, but I have no claim. Now, you will have, Mr. Edwards, if you're as smart and as desperate as I think you are. Now, listen closely. Tomorrow evening at 5.45, an automobile driven by a wealthy mining engineer will turn the corner of Western Avenue onto Hollywood Boulevard. The car will be going slowly because of the traffic. You'll step down from the curb and allow the car to hit you, knocking it down. What? what? Why, this is incredible. <laughs> now, don't worry, Mr. Edwards. We'll take care of everything. You'll not be seriously hurt, but you'll pretend to be. Dr. Alexander, being a physician, has the authority to have you removed. In our car, so no one will know the extent of your injuries. I'm an attorney, and I'll collect from the insurance company on the policy which you'll take out today. You'll be given half that amount. Well, I, uh, I just can't believe it. it well, it's dishonest. Perhaps, a little bit. But the insurance company has unlimited funds. They expect to pay such claims. Why not to you? Oh, but I, I, I couldn't... Now, we're not compelling you to do this, Mr. Edwards. You said you were desperate. He said your wife would die unless she had her operation. 
You wanted to die, Mr. Edwards? Oh, no, no, of course not, but I can... And take I... my advice and cooperate. There's absolutely no risk where you can even close your eyes if you want to make the accident real. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. Now, very well, Mr. Edwards, I'm sorry. I understood that you wanted your wife to be well and happy again. No, no. Wait a minute. Well? Um, very well. I'll do it. Well, that was a mistake, making yourself a party to the crime. Yes, yes, I know. Perhaps it'll give you an idea how desperate I was, Mr. Morgan. I've never done a criminal thing in my life. And, of course, that's the reason you couldn't go to the police. Yes, that's the reason I couldn't go to the police. But surely a slight bump by an automobile didn't bang you up the way you are now. Oh, no, no. The accident was practically nothing. The fender of the car hit me. I fell down. A crowd gathered. Then this Nard Alexander arrived and announced that he was a doctor. Would take me to his office, which was nearby. Some men carried me to a car. And one of the men was Ray Bassett. The next thing I knew, I was being driven away from the city up into the hills. But we came to an abandoned shack. I was ordered out of the car and inside. All right, Edward, sit over there. Now, now look here, Mr. Bassett. I, I want to know what this is all about. My understanding was that I was to pretend to be seriously hurt and that I, I'd be driven to Dr. Alexander's office. <laughs> no kidding. Edward, you're a bigger fool than I thought. Did you actually think we could collect a pile of dough for just a little bump on the seat of your pants? Yes, but you said... That... I said a lot of things. And Doc, hand me that rubber hose. Right. What? Well, what are you going to do? Well, can't you guess, Mr. Edwards? They're going to fix you up so it'll look like you had a real accident. That policy you bought is really going to pay off. What? No. Oh, no, you can't. Wait. Well, you must have... Shut up. Now, Doc, you got your bag of instruments? Right here. Good. I'll do my job first, then you can go to work. Okay, punk. You asked for it! When I get through with you, you'll be worth a fortune to me. How horrible. Yes, it was horrible, Miss Curtis. I lost consciousness. When I came to, I was bandaged, as you see me now, and in an ambulance being driven to this hospital. I heard Dr. Alexander tell the clerk that he had treated me at his office, but that my case was much more serious than he had at first believed. So now you feel that if Bassett and Dr. Alexander learn that you've told your story to anyone, they'll murder you. They will, Mr. Morgan. They promised me they would. Oh, Chuck, this is awful. Mm. Isn't there something that you can do? Well, I guess there's only one thing for me to do, Grandma Puss. What's that? I just have to get myself knocked down by an automobile so I can get to know Mr. Bassett and Dr. Alexander better. Now, the conclusion of Stand By for Crime. Well, it wasn't going to be as easy as all that. Tom Edwards gave us a good description of Bassett and Alexander and the address of the office where he'd been interviewed. Glam and Puss and I went down there. But, of course, the office had been just a front and was now deserted. So, as usual, we went back to KOP and kicked the thing around with my boss, Pappy Mansfield. It's a good yarn, all right, Chuck. But if you use it, you'll be endangering the life of this Tom Edwards. Yeah, I know, Pappy. That's why I'm not going to use it. Not until I get those two sadists behind bars. And just how do you expect to do that? Well, Chuck's got an idea of setting himself up as a guinea pig, Pappy. Letting himself be knocked down by an automobile. Oh, and just what do you expect to prove by that, Chucky boy? I don't know. But before I start proving anything, I've got to locate the two guys who sucked Edwards in on this game. After that, I'll take it from there. Well, you've got a fat chance of finding them. I don't know. I've located missing persons before. Uh, how about the insurance company that sold Tom Edwards the accident policy? That's eh, no good, Grandma Puss. He took out the policy himself, and he's his own beneficiary. When he collects, Bassett and Alexander will force him to turn the money over to them. Or they'll tell the police he got it under false pretenses. Oh, how low can you get? No, I, I, I think we've got to make a different approach. I think that approach should begin with Mrs. Tom Edwards. Put on your shoes, Glamour Puss. Let's go calling. So Glamour Puss put on her shoes and we went calling. We found the Edwards home out in the valley, a modest little stucco house with well-kept lawn and a lived-in look about the place. Mrs. Edwards, a pale, thin woman, was sick all right. 
She apparently hadn't been told of the seriousness of her husband's injuries. Her chief worry was because she hadn't heard from him. Oh, I'm so glad you've come. The hospital merely told me about Tom. I'm too weak to go in to see him. Tell me, how badly hurt is oh, he? Oh, he'll be all right, Mrs. Edwards. Now, don't you worry. Oh. We talked to him this morning. He's getting along fine. Well, you wouldn't lie to me because I, I'm not well. Of course not, Mrs. Edwards. Oh. Tom's doing splendidly. He sent his love and asked us to tell you not to worry. Well, I, I'm sorry I neglected to ask your names. It was rude of me, but I was so anxious to hear about Tom. Are you friends of his from the store? Yes, yes, we're friends of his. My name's Morgan. This is Miss Curtis. How do you do? Tom uh, told us about his troubles, Mrs. Edwards. We're going to try and help him. Tell me, did he ever mention a Mr. Bassett to you? Uh, only once. He said he had an appointment with Mr. Bassett, but he never told me the result of it. Uh -huh. I guess it didn't turn out as well as he'd hoped. And before meeting with Mr. Bassett, he'd borrowed money from as many sources as he could. I suppose you had savings, and maybe a few government bonds, and of course some life insurance? Yes, that's right. We borrowed on them all. Then Tom made some personal loans, though I urged him not to. Uh, did he uh, try to borrow money anywhere else, a loan company or maybe a pawn shop? No, no, not that I can think of. Uh -huh. Oh, wait a minute. He did mention one place. I think it was called the Quick Service Loan Company. Yes, that was it. The Quick Service Loan but he didn't borrow from them. No, why not? Well, their rate of interest was so high, higher than the law allowed, Tom said. He decided to use their service only as a very last resort. I see. Well, I think that's the information we want, Mrs. Edwards. Oh. Thank you so much. But, Chuck, how could the fact that Mr. Edwards talked to the Quick Service Loan Company mean anything? Who knows, Grandma Puss? Just a hunch probably won't mean a thing. But we'll never know until we check, will we? Come on, let's go. On second thought, I told Grandma Puss to get back to the station and tell Pappy the story. I hiked down to the Quick Service Loan Company, a crummy office in a crummy district. I went inside and told the seedy-looking character behind the desk that my name was Al Berquist, and I was in desperate need of funds. He offered me a loan at a rate of interest that made me wonder why the legal loan companies hadn't been put out of business long ago. I told him his interest was too high. He said, okay, forget it. But if I'd be at a certain beer joint on Flag Street at 7 o'clock that night, a man might come in and tell me a story that would make interesting listening. So after I left the quick loan service, I called Grandma Puss, told her to tell Pappy to have a sub do my 7 o'clock broadcast. Then I drove down to the beer joint on Flag Street, slid into a corner booth. At 7 o'clock sharp, the man who answered Tom Edwards' description of Ray Bassett slid in opposite me. He spread out a napkin and put his hand under it and said... There's a gun under this napkin, Morgan. Try anything funny and you get it. Hey, wait a minute. You've got me wrong. I haven't any money. I want to borrow some. Yeah, sure. Your name's Chuck Morgan, ain't it? No, no. It's Al Burquist. I've been mistaken for Chuck Morgan before. No kidding. Morgan, you're even dumber than I thought. Now, let's cut the double talk. Who told you about me? A seedy-looking character at the Quick Service Loan. Huh? And who told you about him? Why, everyone knows a Quick Service Loan. It's a poor man's friend. Plenty of money to land out at a mere 25% interest. You're asking for it, chum. One more chance. Where did you get the dope? What dope? Dope. Okay, smart guy. You know what's going to happen to you? How many guesses do I have? I don't like the looks of your face. I'm going to have a doctor friend of mine change it. Well, that'll please a lot of people. Not what I got in mind won't. I'm going to fix you up so every time you look into the mirror, you wish you'd never messed around with Ray Bassett. So you are Bassett. Well, we're getting someplace. It won't make no difference now if you do know who I am. Oh? No. You made a deal with the quick service loan to play games. You ain't gonna stick your chin out by blabbing. You've got me, Bassett. Let's go call on your doctor friend. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do it right now. Up on your feet and out the back door, sucker. I felt a whole lot less confident than I sounded. Maybe my hunch was cockeyed. If it was, Glamourpus wasn't going to be able to recognize me anymore, and I wonder how she'd like that. Well, we went out the back door of the joint, down an alley, and out onto the street where I parked my jalopy. And we started for the Hollywood Hills. This was the route described by Tom Edwards, so I guessed we were going to follow the same pattern. We left the pavement, hit a dirt road, and climbed a steep incline. At the top, we swung around a curve, and I saw the abandoned shack off in the bushes. All right, get out, keep your hands in sight. Sure, sure, anything to oblige. Hey, better take a look at yourself in that mirror over there, Morgan. 
It'll be your last look at anything familiar about your mug. Thanks. Mind if I straighten my tie? It was a birthday present for my girl. Hey, Doc! Doc! The door opened, and a man came in carrying a physician's black bag. He had cold, inhuman eyes and a perfectly immobile face. Get out your tools, Doc. I got a job for you. Get out your tools, I said. But Doc didn't speak. He just stood there, staring at Bassett with his fish-like eyes. Bassett wasn't in any mood to be stared at without dialogue. Obviously, he was top guy in this outfit, and he wasn't taking silence for an answer when he gave an order. Look, Doc, I said get out your tools. I'm going to do a job on wise guy here. And just because we ain't collecting no insurance money for it don't make no difference. Now get out your tools and go to work. Which was what I'd been waiting to hear, and so had a few other people. The door behind Doc Anderson opened, and Bill Meggs of police headquarters stood there. Bill had a gun in his hand. The door that led to the other side opened, and Pappy Mansfield stepped inside. Pappy also had a gun. Mr. Bassett was surprised, or maybe I should say shocked. He looked around in a dazed sort of way, not getting it, until Pappy said, All right, Bassett, we've heard all we wanted to hear. Get your hands up. Of course, Bassett didn't obey the order. He realized he'd be a cooked gander if he did. But I rather expected this attitude, so I was ready. What the, what are you dirty... <laughs> <laughs> My hunch paid off. But every time I think about what would have happened if it hadn't paid off, I break out in a cold sweat. Bill Meggs took Doc and Ray Bassett off in one of the squad cars that was parked up the road a ways. And Pappy, Carol, who of course was standing by to see that everything went off right, and uh, I drove down to Hollywood and dropped in at the Vine Street Derby for a late dinner. Chuck, some of these days you're going to get hung up on one of your bright ideas, then where will you be? Now don't answer that. But what do you think would happen if Mr. Bassett had taken you somewhere else besides that shack? Oh, don't answer that one either, Chucky boy. Oh, I hate to think about it. It's a funny thing, but uh, I'm satisfied with your looks as they are. Well, you never were very particular, Carol. Now, Chuck, all I want to know is, how did you locate Bassett so easily? Yeah, tell us about that. I can speak then. Oh, sure, sure, sure. The floor's yours, boy. Start talking any time. Oh, George, could we have the menu, please? I think I'll have another beer before ordering. Well, then I will, too. How about you, Chuck? No. He's mad, Pappy. Hmm? Oh, I guess we better let him talk. Yeah, I guess so. All right, Chuck, start bragging. I'm not bragging. You asked a question, I have the answer. Do you want to hear it or don't you? Oh, Chuck, we were only kidding. We're dying to hear the answer. Oh, go ahead and tell us. Well, all right. Now, the only people who knew about Tom Edwards' troubles were those he borrowed money from, Check. Well, government bonds were out. His personal friends were out. So were the insurance companies. That's it. Sure. The only other people who knew about Mr. Edwards' troubles were the quick service loan people. Why, sure. It wasn't any accident that Ray Bassett sat down at Edwards' table in the cafeteria that day. He and the quick service loan people were in cahoots. Why, sure. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Whose face? Look, am I telling this story or are you? You are, Chucky boy. Did we tell you what we were going to do for Mrs. Edwards so she could have her operation? No. Uh, tell him, Pappy. Yeah, tell me, Pappy. This isn't my night for talking. Now, nah, don't get sore, Chuck. Where's your sense of humor? Where's my... Now, nah, listen. When you use this story tomorrow... You're merely going to mention that Mrs. Edwards still needs the money for her operation and see what happens. It'll work, Chuck. You broke up this racket and now you're asking for contributions to help the Edwards. Oh, I bet you'll get thousands. Yeah, what if I don't? Well, then Pappy's going to put up the money. Oh, he is, mm -hmm. is he? <laughs> what do you mean, huh? Five thousand bucks is a lot of yeah, dough. Yeah, sure, sure. Try oh, to get it Chuck, out. Oh, for heaven's sake. You don't seem to realize. Oh, yes, I do. But you don't seem to realize. Chuck, how for heaven's sake. All right, glamour 